Welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Music and Matters podcast and a special bonus episode of the Illuminate podcast. That's right. This is your host, Dr. Emily Williams-Birch, and today's episode is perfect for both podcast platforms. Music educators and music lovers, you're about to learn a lot about music therapy, especially related to hospice. This is a great episode if you are looking at teaching your students about other career fields or if you're looking about getting invested with music therapists in your community. If you're not a musician but you're an Illuminate podcast listener, this episode is going to illuminate the power of music therapy therapy. We talk about what it is, how it works, how you can use it, and so much more. I have been really excited to bring Courtney Tigner onto the podcast ever since I met her a year and a half ago. She has just the sweetest personality and you just crave time with her. She has the best spirit and you can tell why she's a music therapist. In this conversation, we talk about the power of music and how you can employ that and how you can utilize music therapists to overcome things like pain, anxiety, energy, all sorts of fun stuff. You are going to love this conversation. Hey, music people, this episode is brought to you by our friends over at Kaleidoscope Adventures and Kinison Choral Company. Everybody, I'm so thankful that you're listening. It is an honor to be your host. Without further ado, my friend, board-certified music therapist, Miss Courtney Tigner. Today on the podcast, we are welcoming board-certified music therapist and my friend, Courtney Tigner. Hello, Courtney. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm so excited to have this conversation officially. Me too. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> we met about a year and a half ago talking about community service projects between my community choirs and Hospice Savannah, but let's start with introductions. Tell the listener a little bit about who's Courtney Tigner. Okay, who is Courtney Tigner? So as she said before, I'm a board certified music therapist. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Montevallo um, in Alabama, where I'm originally from, originally from Birmingham, Alabama, now living in Savannah, Georgia, where I work with Hospice Savannah as their board certified music therapist. I also got a master's degree uh, in music therapy from Texas. This Woman's University in Denton, Texas. So I've been working with Hospice Savannah for about a year and a half now. It's been absolutely amazing. I actually did my internship with Hospice Savannah, which is what led me to later get my current position there. And they're just an amazing organization that I really, really enjoy working with. Unfortunately, I'll be leaving in a couple of weeks because I'm getting married Yay. and we'll be moving to Mobile, Alabama where I hope to start a private practice in music therapy, hoping to set up some contracts and continue to work in hospice care. Oh, I love it. Okay, let's let's go way back before all the degrees. Okay. How did you first get started in music? Who in music. So I started music when I was in sixth grade in middle school. My first instrument was the flute. I started out on the flute. And I played the flute all through middle school, sixth to eighth grade. And when I got to high school... I wanted to change. Um, I thought the flute was too much like me, skinny and soft. Um, so <laughs> I wanted to change that and I picked up the saxophone. And so totally different from my personality and me. So I really just wanted to jump out there and I really enjoyed it. And I played saxophone all through high school and into college when I started my music degree at Montevallo. I played the saxophone, um, was in all of the, you know, bands that you have to be in as a music major, uh, wind ensemble, jazz band, uh, saxophone choir, uh, and then still doing my own, Hold on. you know, individual Pause. stuff. <laughs> saxophone choir? Can you believe yes, elaborate on what choir. in the world that is? <laughs> yeah, so saxophone choir was, it was definitely a thing. So we had the soprano saxophone, the alto saxophone, the tenor saxophone, and the bass saxophone. And Perfect. so that's, yeah, or yeah. the baritone, excuse me, yeah. the baritone yeah. saxophone. But yeah, that's what, yeah, that was, it was our choir. And so our um, saxophone teacher, Dr. Artavino, 
uh, she would bring up music and all of that kind of stuff and we would play it. And I think one of my favorite pieces we did was The Flight of the Bumblebee. And it was really, really cool to play it uh, through our saxophone choir. It was really nice. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. And now, yeah. as someone who has had the opportunity, Courtney's come to our choir rehearsals and brought her guitar and done. We did some really cool stuff at Christmas, recording some video footage for YouTube for some residents. And we'll get into that later, I'm sure. But we also got to do fireside singing at our recent camping choir tour with all of our singing guys and Courtney you have a lovely voice when did you start singing oh my goodness so I think I've been singing since I was two uh there is recording of me uh with a music book so music has always been in my life because my dad uh, was in a band when he was younger. So he was the lead singer uh, when he was, I think, in high school or, um, or young adult, somewhere in there. And so music has always been a part of my life. My dad was always playing keyboard. Uh, he was always learning the keyboard, had like an electronic drum pad. Um, and so one year for Christmas, they bought my sister a cassette player um, when cassettes were still around. <laughs> Uh, cassette player and this little like children's sing-along book and I go and I pick it up and I just start singing uh, and like totally off key didn't know anything about music at the time but as I got older uh, I remember playing with that cassette player and I recorded myself singing and I played it back and I was like oh, I can sing <laughs> it was That's just like awesome. this eye-opening thing I was like what I can and I actually sound good I can sing and I think I was probably like five or six or seven somewhere in there at the time. I was like, whoa. And I was like so excited. Um, so I just, I kept singing. I would sing at some family members' birthday parties. Um, and then I kind of got a little shy. So I got, I got a little away from it for a little bit. And so I just went into the instrumental part. Um, because whenever I would get up to sing, it was just, I would be super nervous and shaky and I had no breath support because I didn't know about any of that. I didn't take any lessons. Uh, so yeah, it was, yeah, that's how I got into singing. And so as I got older and, you know, more people were more confident or were speaking confidence in, into me, um, it kind of really boosted me up as far as being more confident in my singing voice, um, and wanting to share it with the rest of the world. So isn't that such a life nugget right there though? You can speak confidence into someone. Yeah. What a great way to give back yeah. and to mm -hmm. impact the world bigger than that person probably yeah. even knows that spoke confidence into you. Okay. So how did you choose music therapy? You did music growing up your whole life. You switched from the singing world to the instrumental world. How did you choose music therapy? So when I first went to college, I originally wanted to be a pediatrician. I wanted to work with kids. Um, I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, but going through the science portion of, you know, what was necessary to get into medical school, I quickly found out that that was not what I was going to do. <laughs> it's like, this is not going to work. <laughs> and so I knew I wanted to continue with music, but I knew I, knew I didn't want to be a performer. I didn't want to be a music educator. Uh, I just felt like those things just weren't for me. And so my mom told me, she's like, okay. You go up in your room and you don't come out until you figure it out, <laughs> which was kind of harsh. I felt was kind of harsh at the time. I was like, how am I supposed to figure it out within like a day? Like, how am I supposed to figure out what I want to do for the rest of my life? But I did it. You know, I was obedient. I went, I didn't, you know, talk back. What did you do? Did you Google the, like, what did you I do? Did. I, so I Googled, you know, careers in music. <laughs> that was what I did. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, so I Google careers in music. So uh, the usual, you know, a performer, music educator, um, lesson giver. Um, and so I was just, I was like, music therapy. I was like, okay, that sounds interesting. Okay, tell and the so, listeners, give us, give us like a really good definition. What is music therapy? Okay, so music therapy is an evidence-based practice where you're using um, musical elements to achieve non-musical goals. Uh, so it's a very broad um, profession where it can whew, it can be used in any population from birth all the way up until death, as you know, with me working in hospice care. Uh, so you're mostly found um, in schools, um, working with kids with developmental disabilities, autism, um, and then you got people in, in hospitals, working in NICU. Uh, you may have heard of... Um, that stands for the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. I only know yes. because I'm a NICU baby. 
Ah, okay. Yeah, so you can see it in, in NICU, uh, say end of life. You can see it in rehabilitation services. Uh, yeah, it's just you can find music therapy pretty much anywhere. It can pretty much be used with anything. It's incredible. So uh, all of the research and evidence. Yeah. How does it work? Like what, what are people researching? What does the evidence say? So the evidence says that music therapy... Um, as far as hospice goes, I'll, I'll go from my own, you know, my <laughs> my own area from what I've been working in. Um, but the research says that music therapy really increases quality of life. It helps with pain and anxiety when medicine is not working. Um, it helps to um, let me say increase quality of life, pain and anxiety. It can help to restore relationships especially at the end of life, things can be really tense among family members. Things can be, people don't want to talk about certain things. People don't want to talk about death, you know, in our society, I think is getting a little better, but there's a huge stigma around death. Nobody wants to talk about it, even though we're all going to have to go through it one day, you know, nobody's going to escape it. Um, but nobody really wants to talk about it. So using music as a way to say goodbye to playing your funeral music, I've sung at a few funerals. Um, and people always come up to me and they, they, you know, they say, thank you so much for being able to provide music. Cause there's a saying that I've heard a lot when words fail, music speaks. Mm -hmm. Um, so sometimes when, you know, you just don't have the words, music can be the perfect way to express your feelings and expression is another way that music therapy helps in hospice care. Um, like I said, with saying goodbye, with saying final words, with, um, any resolutions that, people want to resolve any familial issues um, that they want to resolve before they die because you know you don't want to leave anything unsaid because once that person dies you know you're not going to get another chance um, so yeah, it's just it's just a few of the things yeah so how do you pick the music and what does this session look like let's let's pretend we're walking with you into one of your music therapy sessions where do you get the music? What does it look like? How much are you singing, playing? How does it work? Well, yeah, it all starts with a referral. Um, so I can get a referral from anybody. I can get a referral from our doctors, our nurses, our CNA, certified nursing assistants, from our chaplains, from our social workers. I can get yeah a referral from anybody on our team who's part of the patient's care team. And so once I get a referral, they usually give me a reason for the referral. So we have a document that they will fill out and they'll tell me the patient's name. Um, I can look up their diagnosis in our electronic filing system and they'll give me the reasons. So some of those reasons can be for pain, agitation, emotional support. Patients go through uh, depression, um, some especially those who are really young. Um, who feel like it's really unfair with, with what, they, what they're going through. Um, and so emotional support, spiritual support, those who can't get out into their religious communities anymore, they're kind of stuck at home and they can't go to church. So there's a variety of reasons um, why somebody could be referred to music therapy. And so once I get this referral, I make contact with the patient. I either make contact with the patient or with a family member. And that's kind of my introduction uh, into uh, that's how I get my foot in the door with seeing the patient. So I'll call either them or the family member and kind of get a little information about the patient. So this is where I learned if they were a singer before, if they played any instruments, um, how long they have been singing, how long they have been playing instruments, how did they use their musical abilities. And then we get into what kind of music they like. I never put my own preferences of music onto a patient. It's always patient preferred music. I never want to go in playing something that the patient will not enjoy because that won't be beneficial to them. Uh, so I ask them what's their favorite kind of music. And so they'll tell me, I was like, oh. And a lot of times they'll tell me, oh, she likes anything. And that's so hard. <laughs> that's so hard um, because I have a lot of music. So if you can like narrow it down to like a specific time period or, you know, a specific genre, that would be really, really helpful. And so yeah, I try and tell them or ask them um, more clarifying questions. Uh, and then we go from there. We schedule a time uh, for an assessment. Uh, and that's where I, you know, I, I go in and I meet with the patient. 
um, depending on if the patient is verbal or nonverbal, how alert they are. Um, I start my session off either making conversation with the patient, um, introducing myself, and then we get started. So we'll play, I'll see how they're reacting to the music. Um, and it's also based on what they need. So if they're having pain, um, I'll have them um, just relax and close their eyes um, and I'll start playing so I can do like a song cycle. And so a song cycle is when I'm just playing music continuously without stopping, just doing transitions into different songs where I'm not stopping the music. And so that gives them a chance to I call it, it's called music-based refocusing because if they're focusing on the music, they're not focusing on their pain. Mm. And so that's a way of um, helping to relieve pain uh, without medicine if it's, you know, it's, if it's possible. Um, and so I've seen that happen a lot and it amazes me every time I see it, um, that a person can be in so much pain when I get there and by the time I leave, they're like, I forgot and I had pain. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing to see every time. How rewarding. Um, it's like, I just totally forgot I was in pain because I was so entranced with the music and your voice just really helped and the music helped. Um, and so, yeah, just seeing their reactions to the music, depending on how alert I have some patients who really love to dance or who are really active. And so I'll bring in the instruments. I'll bring in a drum. I'll bring in maracas. Um, shakers anything just to have a little fun you know make it fun for them um and they'll participate in that and sometimes i'll use recording music uh, i have one patient she used to go to the club a lot when she was younger so i would play like luther vandross and uh earth wind and fire and just like really upbeat songs and we just dance through the entire session and it's amazing uh, so yeah sometimes i don't even have to bring in my guitar sometimes recording music is okay uh, because there's just certain elements of the music that I can't really copy on a guitar, you know, that really activates their mind. Um, so, yeah, so recorded music is done as well. And so after that, we'll see if they want me to come back. And um, usually it's yes. <laughs> it's very rare where I get a no, I don't want you to come back, uh, which I really enjoy. And so we schedule how often they like me to come. I usually come every, do every other week because I am the only music therapist on staff. I can't see everybody every week um, mm -hmm. as much as they would like me to. Um, so I usually do every other week or every three weeks or once a month. It's totally up to the patient or the family member. And that's how it goes. Wow. Okay. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> One. That's like so much to go That through. was so interesting. So <laughs> it's, it's so individualized. I'm dying to know yeah. how you know so much music and where do you put it? Oh, <laughs> So thankfully, uh, it's not all up here. It's like impossible. Um, sometimes I will memorize music for sessions depending on, you know, what's needed. Uh, if it's a focus, but for the most part, I have my iPad. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank God for technology these days. Um, it's really helpful. So I use an app called Fourscore, um, which was um, suggested to me by my then uh, supervisor mentor, uh, when I was doing my internship. And so I use four score and I have over 600 pieces of music in it. And that's how, and I have it all organized by genre, by artists, by the decades. Um, so I have it all. And so once I get to know a patient, I make a specific set list for that patient. Uh, once I know what they like and what they enjoy. So when I go in, when I'm going to see a patient, I open my iPad, I go to their name and I have a list of all the songs that they like. And of course, it's impossible for me to know every single song mm -hmm. in the world. But um, if there's one special song that's really, really specifically important to the patient, I'll learn it. Um, and so I can just, it doesn't take me long to learn a song, depending on the difficulty of it. I've learned a song like right before a session, <laughs> like well, I'm, I'm on my way and I'm Let listening to it, it in, in the car, car. <laughs> and just like, like, okay, okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. And then, yeah, I get there and then I'm able to play it. Uh, so sometimes it doesn't take me long. Sometimes it can be a little difficult. It just depends on the complexity of the song. Um, but usually, 
um, that just lights up their face when they mm-hmm. hear a song that they hadn't heard in years and it was so special to them. It was a song that their mom sung to them or that they sung in a choir once. It's just it's just amazing to and it lasts. Like their family members remember that and it's like they they remember you play this song that they hadn't heard in years and for you to go home and learn it even though you didn't know it learn it just for them even though I may never sing the song again which isn't always the case um even though I may never sing that song again to know that um I went home and learned it it means so much to the patient and to their families and if they have guests over and I sing that particular song that's like she learned that just for him like they point that out it's it's just so amazing so yeah that's such yeah that's how touch. I that's my process yeah okay that makes you feel a little less stressed that you don't have to keep yeah. it all in your brain that you're organized. right yeah what oh about guitar goodness. you told us about singing and flute and saxophone when did you pick up guitar so I picked up the guitar once I started uh, my music degree at Montebello once I knew I was going to go into music therapy I knew that the guitar was the main instrument for music therapists. So I took, or so I signed up for private guitar lessons as an elective, as one of my electives, and took 30 minute guitar lessons for, um, I think, three or four semesters. Um, and so, yeah, that was how I learned how to play the guitar. Yeah. Well, you play year, famously. It was so, <laughs> it's been so much fun to learn and play and sing with you. Let's kind of switch gears. We've kind of been talking hospice, perf- like hospice sides of things and how you do it. For someone listening that wants to get involved with a music therapist, what are the steps? How do they, like, for example, your private practice that you'll start in Mobile. Mm-hmm. How does someone find a music therapist in their area and what would that look like and how could they help their family or their situation? Okay, so we have several groups through Facebook, um, music therapy groups, Um, but I think the main thing is the um, American Music Therapy Association, uh, which is their website is musictherapy.org, and they have a list of all of the music therapists who are board certified. Uh, That's the main place where people can go if you're looking for a music therapist. Um, because they'll have their contact information, where they're located. Uh, but yeah, musictherapy.org is the biggest resource for finding a music therapist. Yeah. And so when people go to look at music therapy, whether that's for a future career or for some, someone to help them through pain or all the other awesome examples that you gave us, they'll have someone come in and do an assessment. What would you say for someone go, looking for music therapy? What would be your advice for their first time? Mm, what would be their advice for the first time? I say give it time. Don't expect something to happen immediately. Um, like sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it takes it takes a little bit of time. I say give it some time for it to work and to see if it'll have an effect before writing it off. Because a lot of people see music therapists as entertainers. When I walk into a nursing home, people think I'm the entertainment. I'm the music lady, so they say. Um, So like I'm there to entertain, but they don't really see that I'm actually providing a very beneficial therapeutic service to the patient, even though they may not see it that way. Um, And so sometimes we really have to be advocates for ourselves Uh, Because people only see, you know, you walk in with a guitar and people just think you're there to entertain them. Um, And that's not the case. So, yeah, I definitely say give it some time. Um, Be open minded about it. Yeah, because it can. It's very beneficial. It can definitely work. Yeah. Yeah. I love music therapy so much. I was, I'm a NICU baby and there was music therapy in my hospital when I was born two and a half months early. And wow. then when I got my master's degree, it was at Florida State, which is a big music therapy program. Right, yeah, yeah. And so I got to work with an intergenerational rock choir where right. I went in and it was the uh, the grandparents and the children and the grandchildren and they would all come one day a week and we would do like physical motion, hands above your head and moving your body around to get some very uh, age appropriate movement. But then we brought in electric guitar and bass and drums and we did Beatles and Third Dog Night, Third Day Night, Third Dog Night. All the words are getting mixed up in my brain. Third Dog Night. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> It was so much. I mean, we did Coldplay. Nice. Holy smokes. We did some Elvis. It was so much fun. And just the joy on their faces. And you're right, the time. Each mm-hmm. week they come back. 
I think music therapy is so awesome. I'm really excited to illuminate it as a possible career, as a possible therapy for someone going through something or looking to grow. But really, I'm excited to illuminate you too. I can't wait to see what happens with your private practice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I hope to get it off the ground and running, hopefully. (laughs) Yeah, you'll have to keep us posted. All right, I didn't give you these questions beforehand, but I'm going to release this episode on both my Music Ed Matters podcast and the Illuminate podcast because I think it applies to all of the listeners. So on the Illuminate podcast, we ask four end of show questions. The first question is... What is the most recent or best book you have read? Mm, most recent. Oh, man. I can't say I've done a lot of reading. Because you're learning uh, 8 billion like, songs. I have. I know. I've been learning. <laughs> just learning music. Um, I mean, I have been reading books, but it mostly pertains to my fiance and our upcoming marriage. Yes. Yes. Um, but I do want to suggest a book. Um So this book has been really helpful. This is called um, Hospice and Palliative Care, Music Therapy. It's by uh, Dr. Russell Hilliard. He is really, really great um, and is known as starting the first music therapy program uh, with Seasons Hospice. Um, And so it's a really good book when you want to learn more about hospice and palliative care music therapy. Um, it gives you a lot about the different, the many, many different goals and um, benefits of music therapy that I didn't mention. Um, but as far as my uh, profession, I remember reading this book in grad school. It's called Dying Well by Ira Bayak, and it gives a really great perspective of dying with dignity. Um, every story, it's It is very captivating, very eye-opening. But that would be some, a couple that I would um, suggest because I honestly, I haven't been doing, I have been doing reading, but not. Yeah, you're getting ready to get married. You have a lot of other things on your brain. You got (laughs) to learn music, plan a wedding, and read. Yes, find all the things. Hey, those are two great books. I'll make sure to link them in the episode notes. All right, question number two. Who or what is illuminating or inspiring you right now? Hmm. I have definitely have to say where I work, Hospice Savannah. Um, We just finished up a kids grief camp called Camp Aloha. Um, And it was the first time we've been able to have it since 2019 due to, you know, the pandemic. And what Camp Aloha is, is an overnight grief camp for kids ages 6 to 17. And they get to stay overnight at New Ebenezer Retreat. Uh, here in Georgia, and it's just a very, oh man, it's a very emotional uh, journey where the kids participate in different activities to help them express themselves um, through about their grief journeys and about their loved ones who have died. Um, and the last time we had this camp, I was an intern. So when we had it this year, I was actually the music therapist and, you know, able to put together um, an activity and really be in charge. And, you know, it was just really, really exciting to be a part of it in a different, uh, a different way, more in a a leadership type role. Um, And so it's just seeing how these kids express themselves and lean on each other and confide in each other, uh, because even though their journeys are different, um, they're still, they find similarities in their journeys and they bond through that. And one of the biggest things that we do is a bonfire at the end. So we have all of the kids write a letter to their loved ones. Um, and they come to the bonfire and they say their name and who they're there to honor or celebrate or remember. And they drop their letters into this box and then they take the box and they place it on the fire and you know the the letters burn and you know this fire and smoke and so that's a way for them to send their words to their loved ones and it's just such a beautiful beautiful ceremony a beautiful ritual that's been done and this year was the 25th year um that Camp Aloha has been done so I'm just so honored to work with an organization that really um wants to include everybody uh, who is included with a patient's um, life, even down to the pets. They'll find somebody, you know, to take somebody's pets when they die. Um, it, it's just the the things that the organi- organization does. Is, it's just 
it blows my mind and I'm just so glad to be a part of it. Yeah. You answered question two and three in that way because okay. Camp Aloha <laughs> is illuminating you right now. And question it three is, is really what's an organization is. you'd like to illuminate? And I think Hospice right. Savannah is definitely worth illuminating. So I'll include those links below. All right, last question. Okay. What is the message that you want to send to the listeners? Mm. Message I want to send to the listeners. Take time to dance. <laughs> There's so much going on in our world right now, and it can be so, so discouraging. Um, and so when I, when I find that I'm getting overwhelmed with things, cause I'm an empath and so I tend to take on a lot of emotions. And so when I feel that I'm getting overwhelmed and it's just too much, I turn on music and I just dance. I always say if I wasn't a music therapist, I think I would want to be a dancer. I really would. Um, but yeah, like take some time for yourself. Like, and it can it doesn't have to be dancing, but just taking time to do something that fills you up, that energizes you, um, that takes your mind off of the cares and the worries of the world, because it can be very overwhelming. Uh, so taking that time to do something for yourself, whether it's 10, 20, 30 minutes, an hour, five minutes, just, just take some time for yourself just to get away. Um, just do something for yourself. Yeah. Maybe listen to some great music. Yeah, let's do some great do music. Do yeah. music therapy. Oh, Courtney, this yeah. has been so great. Thank you for sharing all yeah, that you do as a musical therapist and what we can learn from it. And I think I might turn on some good music while I edit. Hey, it's perfect. Awesome. <laughs> thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been awesome. Did anyone else hear that song in their head? I hope you dance when she said dance. Just like she said, whether it's dancing or listening to music or just going outside to soak up some vitamin D and some sunshine, I hope that you take some time today to find your perfect space to refill. That might be through music. You should try it. Listen to music from different decades, from different genres. See what fills your cup in different times of need. There's so much power in music. And like Courtney said, give it time. See how it works. I want to hear what you think. Make sure to let us know. I hope that you have a great day. Know that whatever you're doing, you matter. We all know that music ed matters, especially illuminating awesome careers like music therapy. And I'll see you all next time on whichever show you're listening to.